This year has been amazing, but it's been a bit of a roller coaster. Some really high highs, some really low lows, but in those highs, I figured out my why. Why I do what I do, why I'm in this field, why I chose this career. And in those low lows, I needed to remember that why. And I do, because at the core, I know my why. Dr. Watts, who is our Project Lifts um, superintendent of our zone, she addressed our community at the beginning of the year. And she was very careful to point out that education was a healthy balance of head work and heart work. I know my why. We know the head work. We went to school for the head work. I'm amongst friends here. We know what the head work is. It's our collaborative workspaces. It's our rigor. It's our curriculum. It's our PLCs and PDs and other acronyms. We know that part. That's all in the head. But the heart, well, that's my why. That's the illumination. That's the inspiration. That's the love. That's the care. We are not robots with books standing in front of kids, Vanna whiting our way to the next best thing. We're just not. We are heart. So last year, I was invited to a pretty swanky dinner party. And you know, I went because I'm a teacher and I can't afford to go to this party. So of course I went. <laughs> of course I said yes. And so it was a banker's party with a lot of um, hedge funders and accountants, who, you know, some of the who's who of Charlotte. And I was super excited to kind of rub elbows with the old money, new money, new, new money, more money than me, it didn't matter. So I went. I was excited about the Chilean sea bass. I was really excited to get that down, you know, because I don't get to buy it. I'll just keep putting that point out there. And so I'm at this place, and I'm in this, you know, beautiful restaurant with all of these people who are just amazing, and I'm networking my behind off. And then it comes time for dinner, and I am set down at a table of all the people that I've met with a bunch of competitors. I mean, these people could not stop talking about how great they were. And I get it. I thought they were great, too. I wasn't going to let them know that. I mean, they were competitors. They were talking about the size of their bank accounts and what they were doing with their teams and how they were going to make it to another team and their IPOs. And I don't know what any of that means. I was eating. <laughs> I was. I like to eat. <laughs> they were just, it was foreign language to me. But as conversations among career braggarts goes, the conversation turned to the why. And their why wasn't my why. Their why was why they did it, why they're on this team, you know, why they're going to make this change so they can make this new thing. And none of that's bad. I'm not saying any of this is bad. I'm saying it's foreign language to me. But then as conversations or months, career braggarts go, it turned to the lowest man on the totem pole, stuff in her face. <laughs> that was me. So they asked me, why do you do what you do? I mean, and I'm trying to kind of emulate them in a, a sense. Why do you do what you do? I don't get it. I mean, you know, that's cute. You know, you teach. That's really cute. That's cool. But why do you do what you do? And one of the comments was, not so much annoying as funny, but maybe a little bit of both. There's virtually no long-term reward for you, Todd. Oh, no, no, no. I haven't given you the best one. I haven't given you the best one. You seem so smart. Why would you choose a career in education? So as I wipe my mouth, I had to get myself ready because I wanted to give them the why. But I didn't want to just give them the why. I wanted to gut punch them with the why. I wanted to let them know. And so I took that time as a teacher to give a teachable moment. That's what we do. I gave my teachable moment. So I said to them, I knew, I knew the room, so I knew how I could work it a little bit. So I said to them, um, well, hey, do you know um, Hugh McCall? You know who he is? And they're like, 
oh yeah, we know who he is. You know, Mr. Bank of America, revolutionized banking, Mr. Charlotte, and all of those things well deserved. And they go into bragging about how they know him. And I interrupted them. I said, well, yesterday when I ran into Hugh, you know, because we're good friends, it's not true. I actually literally ran into him and was introduced to him literally 24 hours ago, but I wasn't going to let them know that. I said, when I ran into Hugh, we had an interesting conversation. The conversation was not about banking, though. The conversation was not about the economy or, you know, how new money was changing Charlotte or any of that. When he found out what I did, he said to me, man, your job is so important. I remember when I was inspired by the teacher. I even remember who the teacher was. I remember a teacher telling me to think outside the box. That's what he said to me. He said, your job is important. And that's why I put so much of myself into education now. So I said to these friends at the table, you see, you all are benefactors of a revolutionary thinker who was inspired by a Miss Todd long ago. You're welcome. <laughs> See, here's the thing. The hard work is what he was talking about. He didn't talk about a great work of art. He didn't talk about a room set up with colorful lights or great borders. He talked about inspiration. That's hard work. Imagine for a second your Pinterest perfect classroom. All right? You all know what I'm talking about. Don't act like you don't. <laughs> I'm on Pinterest every single morning. So imagine for a second your Pinterest perfect classroom. All right? You've got the borders going. You've got your differentiation up. You've got your choice boards. You've got your borders. You've got color and, and all kinds of light and shimmery lesson plans. I mean, they are award winning. And you are about to Vanna White your way through your PowerPoint. But then in walks student A. Student A had been locked in a closet, true story, for seven days and withheld food. Student A walks in your room, and he is still in every thing he can get his hands on, but he's really looking for food. Student A is distracting and distracted. And when he walks in and he's stealing and I'm looking like, oh God, not again. Keep your hands to yourself. Keep your hands out of people's things. But a hungry brain doesn't think. And then in walks student B. Now student B, he's been sleeping in the back of the car because mom works, mom works at night. And mom works a lot at night. And he has to take care of his little sister. And he's already a little. So he has to take care of his little sister. He doesn't get much time from adults. He doesn't get much time from anyone. And in he walks in your classroom, all your lovely wall work that you stayed up for three days thinking about and five days at the beginning of the school year putting together, he comes and rips it to shreds. True story. And I mean rips it to shreds. A neglected brain wants attention. And then in walks student C, true story. See, student C just came to you from another state, and she didn't really walk in the door. She was brought in by the school psychologist kicking and screaming, literally. And she cried from 7.15 a.m. to 3.15 p.m. And she tore up everything she can get her hands on. And every time I tried to approach student C, she would scream, Bloody Mary. It was a nightmare. But what we didn't know was that student C had been found padlocked to the bottom of a bed, left for dead. True story. See, all that head work is awesome and it's necessary. Please don't think that I don't think that it is. It is. It is not everything. It's not the first thing. It certainly isn't the only thing. Those students didn't need an amazing curriculum then. 
Those students did not need fancy pants walls. They needed a connection. And I learned it the hard way, but I learned it. That's hard work. And finally, let me tell you about her. She is amazing. I worked in a pre-K to eight school. I was a lower elementary teacher. She was a middle, middle school student. She walks in, she's got in her, you know, she's all in her black. She has several bags on her back, one across her waist and two in her hand. Every day, same clothes, same bags, head bowed, shoulders hunched, every day. And so for some random reason, I felt it was my mission to speak to her. It wasn't that deep. I just was like, she never speaks, I'm gonna speak to her. So that turned into a thing. So I used to like kind of accost her. You know, are you gonna speak today? Hey, friend, hey, you need me to help you? No response, for months. Then all of a sudden, she started speaking back. Months. Then all of a sudden, she started finding me. Months later, she found herself in my room. And months later, she told me her story. See, this friend had been through things we could not imagine. When I tell you cannot imagine, you cannot, you cannot imagine it. She had also never had a home, never been in a home. So all those bags, all of that stuff, that was her stuff. Here were her shoes her toiletry items, her clothes, her books, her stuff. And through that year, I had a new mission. It was to make her life great. That's not realistic. I made a connection with her that opened up a world of opportunities. It opened up her brain to the possibility of the, of the whatever. I saw her and she saw me and we forged a relationship and she opened up herself. She would walk down the hallway and she was no longer in black. She was in dark blue, you know, <laughs> baby steps. But all of a sudden one bag came off and one bag stayed in my classroom while she went to her classes. And then another bag was in my classroom. And all of a sudden she's walking down the hallway with a book bag and blue clothes on and now her hair comes down. And then she opened herself up to the possibility of others helping and that happened. She opened herself up to the possibility of other teachers and other people participating in her life. And one of her teachers did just that. And in that time, we found out together that she is a talented artist. Two years later, but she's talented. She created a sculpture that her teacher submitted for a national award, and she won it. And her artwork was here in Spirit Square for 30 days. Let me tell you about that sculpture. That sculpture was something. That sculpture was an open heart. It was red on the outside and black on the inside, and inside it had these little miniature figurine, gold figurines with light bulb heads. And when she flipped that light on, it illuminated the inside of the heart. And so for a while I'd asked her, but you had to step on eggshells with her. You had to tread very slowly, very carefully. And she went and tell me, we came here to pick it up one day at the end of its time. And I put it in my trunk. I said, listen, girl, you have to tell me what this is about. I know I can guess. You already told me that. But I need to know what this is about. She said, OK. OK, Ms. Todd. She said, well, this is my heart. And it was black on the inside because I didn't care. And I didn't have anything to look forward to. She said, these people? These are the people that helped me. And she said, that, that was you. And when I flipped on the light, it illuminated my heart. That was the day whew, that I found my purpose. I figured out the reason why I do what I do. I can do the head work. Anybody really can. But can you do the work of the heart? Those choices are not always logical, but matters of the heart are oftentimes illogical. She has gotten into an art school. She is the first in her family of 12 siblings to get to ninth grade. True story. She told me when I won Teacher of the Year 
She said, this is kind of your moment, Miss Todd, but it's kind of mine. <laughs> you can have it. <laughs> but she told me, you know that sculpture? I said, yeah. She said, well, you're the light in my heart. But what she didn't realize, <laughs> that she was the light in mine. Hard work. Thank you.